so people have different levels of expertise in this, so I'm going to apologize for people who already know what I'm going to say at the beginning. Some of this is going to be review. OK, so I wanted to start out by talking about the goal. So let's say we have a non-negative integer, g, and we have some number of conjugacy classes. in SU2, then we can define a space M just to take the product of the conjugacy classes. And then you can take uh, two G copies of SU2. And you can define a map. from M uh, to SU2 just by taking, um, so what's your element going to look like? You're going to have N elements in the conjugacy classes and then two G elements in S anywhere in SU2. And I want to just take this class and I want to first take it to the product of the FJ. And then I can take it to the product of the commutators of the AJBJ. OK, great. So this is a well-defined map. And what's pretty obvious well, is that we have a, a G action, or SU2, rather, acts on M just by conjugation diagonally. And it's easy to check that this map is equivariant, where again, so Groups are always like acting on themselves by conjugation. And if I forget to say what an action is, that's what I mean. Um, I will try to say it. And so therefore, because we have these actions in this equivariance, we can define a topological space. This is a curly M that's not the same M. I can just take the inverse image of the identity, and I can divide out by SU2. So great, this was a very easy thing to define. But this turns out to be an important space. This is the moduli space of flat SU2 bundles over a surface, so a Riemann surface, if you like, a genus G with N punctures. And we've seen a lot of talks mention uh, moduli spaces in various interesting ways. These are important spaces, just in general. And, and this, in particular, is an important moduli space. Um, and so our goal is to study the topology of M and other similar spaces. For instance, obviously, you could do other groups. Um, that's the goal of today's talk, is to give a method which is sort of very general, but allows us to study spaces like these. And I should mention a little bit about some um, other methods. So there's a number of methods for doing this. The original way, sort of more sort of a number theoretic by Narashiman and Sashadra. This is a very important whole area, and there's many, many other people that have worked in this light, and I'm not going to talk about this at all. <laughs> so this is a different thing, but I just want to mention there's a whole other way of looking at this. Um, that's one method. Another method, which is really the method I'm going to focus on, um, was by Atiyah and Bot. So they studied this problem, but not in the case with punctures. So zero punctures, you can do that. And morally, what they did is they used Morse theory to study this. Now, in fact, they, they didn't actually do it technically with Morse theory. Um, but that was very much the motivating principle. This is their paper on yang uh, so, And this is the approach. So there's going to be a number of differences 
In fact, this work is joint with Bott and Weizmann, um, but it was very much inspired by their approach. And I should also mention um, Hoyle and Thaddeus also had a different methods of using Morse theory. But theirs are, again, very different. So I'm not going to talk too much about how they relate, but I want to make sure I credit them. OK, so that's the goal of the talk. Is everybody happy with sort of where we're going? OK. So I need to establish some notation. And this notation will be fixed throughout. G is a compact Lie group. And T contained in G is going to be the maximal torus. And this, the Lie G, is going to be the Lie algebra of G. And I want to fix a metric on G. And I'm going to use this to identify G star with G pretty freely. So if you ever find yourself saying, wait, wait, that's not a G, that's a G star. Yeah. <laughs> I've identified them. OK. So I want to mention a little bit about equivariant cohomology, which, again, I think most of you know about, but I don't know if everybody does. So let's say G acts on a space Y. Then we can define the equivariant cohomology of Y to be the ordinary cohomology of you take Y and you take its product with EG, which is just any contractible space on which G acts freely and then you divide out by G. So this is a nice way of doing cohomology when you have actions. And I'll also talk about the equivariant Poincaré polynomial, which is just sort of the obvious thing once you have the cohomology. It's T to the I times the dimension of H I G. So it's just like the ordinary Poincaré polynomial, but for equivariant cohomology. And the example, if you haven't seen this, the example, which is kind of key to understanding this, is SU2 acts trivially on a point, and the equivariant Poincaré polynomial is just 1 divided by 1 minus t to the fourth. So it's 1 plus t to the fourth plus t to the eighth plus t to the twelfth. And this, this 1 over 1 minus t to the fourth comes up a lot, that kind of equation. OK, so that was just a little background. Um, so the, um, I want to briefly review what happens in the finite dimensional case. And then um, our goal is going to be extend this to the infinite dimensional case. And I will use the same notation. And went back and forth. But so, so we start with x as a manifold. And we're going to have a two form on this, which is symplectic. So this is all stuff we've seen many times, but I'll do it quickly. And we have uh, the G acts on X, preserving omega. And we want to assume that there is a proper moment map mu from X to G star, but remember, I'm identifying that with G. And so this is just the adjoint action. Uh, and I want this map to be equivariant with respect to the adjoint action. And I want Ix x omega equals negative d mu xi for all xi and g. So again, we've seen this, but I'm sort of going through it again because I'm going to have to change it for the infinite dimensions. I'm just sort of setting you up for how this works. And um, so this is something that sometimes confuses people. So for simplicity, I'm going to assume that 0 is regular. We really don't need that at all. You can totally get rid of that if you want. It's not important for any of the theorems. But it enables me to state things a little nicer. So for the experts, just ignore that. But for the rest of us, this means that the reduced space 
is a compact symplectic orbifold. And that is cohomology. So when I say something that's apology, uh, particularly I'm going to be interested in the cohomology. This is just equal to the equivariant cohomology of the level set of zero. This is a general fact. And here I'm using Q coefficients. And everywhere in this talk, I may say a little bit about integer coefficients, but until I get there, you should always assume Q coefficients. Things go, go wrong otherwise. So great. So um, so these spaces were studied by, among other people, Kirwan. And what she did is, remember we have a metric. So you can take your moment map and get a single function, mu squared. And what she proved is that mu squared is a Morse function. So I should be honest and say, in the sense of Kerwin. So this is more general in that it not only, like Morse bot functions, allows critical submanifolds, but also it allows local minimum. But the basic point is she proved that this satisfies some, some conditions that guarantee that you have the same, the exact same sequence as you'd expect to in the Moore situation. And everything goes through. And she also showed what the critical set is. So I'll call this S. And it's just the set of X and X such that mu of x, which remember now is an element of g, is in the stabilizer of x. So its moment image fixes, is an element of the algebra that fixes the point. And one thing you should notice about this set, which is very important, is that this contains mu inverse of 0, right? Because 0 is in the stabilizer of every point. So there's nothing to check there. In fact, that is one of the components. Not too much harder to say. OK, great. So with Morse theory, you want to know what the critical set is. You also want to know what the index is at every critical component. Those are the basic things you need. And given an x in a component C contained in S, and let's pick a component such that mu of x which we'll call it C, is in the Lie algebra of the maximal torus. Well, if you do this, then you can look at sorry, you can look at the stabilizer of C as a subgroup. And you can let that act on T. And this gives you a subset of this gives you a subset of G. And you can take mu inverse of this. And this is not a manifold, but it is a manifold near X. So you, you have a well-defined vector space. And this is a symplectic representation of the stabilizer of X. That's a pretty easy lemma. And what she proves is that the index of C, well, we're calling it the index of C, but this is the index at any point in C. So the index is the same at all points, is just equal to 2 times the number of weights eta in this representation whose pairing with C is less than 0. So what we think about it is just the number of negative weights, twice the number of negative weights. So how am I doing this time? I'm doing good. OK. So great. So what does this tell us?
Well, first of all, what does it mean when I say that it's a Morse function? This means that, OK, I have my manifold x, and I have some critical set c, and I can look at, I can let x plus and x minus, I look at the pre-image of, well, so, so x plus is, so I, maybe I should call this f, is f inverse of negative value a plus epsilon and x minus equals f inverse negative infinity a minus epsilon. So this is the normal thing in Morse theory. You look at just below a critical value and then just above a critical value, and you get, so I'm doing equivariant cohomology. It turns out to be the right thing. I get a long exact sequence for the pair, just the ordinary thing. that you always get when you have a pair. But now the fact that it's Morse precisely means that I can identify this with the shifted cohomology of the critical set. And of course, I can restrict here, too. And it turns out that, and this is sort of a very clever idea, the fact that the critical points are the fixed points in some sense. I mean, if you, if you think about what this means, one way of thinking about it is that fixed points are critical. Um, tells you that this map is one to one. And once you have that, you have that this split into short exact sequences. And that's often written as that mu squared is equivariantly perfect. So equivariantly, because this is an equivariant cohomology, and perfect because these sequences split, which is the nicest thing that could possibly happen in Morse theory. There's no cancellations whatsoever. And this is really the miracle of this whole subject. And this miracle, uh, as far as I know, was actually first put out in a Tiabat's paper. Kirwan used their idea based on a lemma that's in their paper. OK, so great. So what is this telling us? Well, if, you're, if there's no cancellations, you don't get Morse inequalities, you get Morse equalities. So that's wonderful. Um, so if you get two things, and of course she proved other things, but the first thing she proved is that you have a natural map from the equivariant cohomology of x to the equivariant cohomology of the level set which, as we've already seen, is just the cohomology of the reduced space. And what she proved, what follows more or less immediately from what I've said here, is that this map is onto. Because you see at every stage you have an onto this, and you just keep on, right? This, this map was onto, and then the next stage is onto, the next stage is onto, so it's onto everywhere. It's more or less immediate. And, and the thing to remember here, of course, is that that mu inverse of zero is the, the minimum, right? Because mu squared is always positive. And that's the first thing she proved. And the other thing she proved is that you can compute the cohomology of the reduced space very explicitly, because this is just one of the critical components. So this is PG of x minus the sum over C contained in S minus mu inverse of zero of t lambda c pg of c. So the more typical way would be to put all the critical components on one side, right? And then you get an equation. But this is what I actually care about, so I'm putting that on that side. Um, and so this is, this is her theorem. I, I guess in all honesty, I believe that she stated it in the compact case, but it works in the proper case without any modifications whatsoever. So. Um, Okay, so that is the classical case. Are there any questions about this? Okay, so what, what we're actually doing is trying to extend this to the infinite dimensional case, but not sort of all infinite dimensional cases, but for loop group actions. So I need to talk a little bit about loop groups. A 
I'm sorry, what is this? Oh. Okay. I don't think so. I, I, I think, I mean, it has to, you, you, you're starting from, some, So, so what is the loop group? This is just uh, maps from uh, gamma from S1 to G, and this is obviously a group, right? You can just do pointwise multiplication. And I, I will say there are some Sobolov issues that I'm gonna ignore. Um, they're not super deep and they've mostly been worked out, but they are there. And then, in a natural way, it's Lie algebra is functions from S1 until G. And I'm going to formally define LG star in a slightly weird way. This is maps from 0, 1 to G, such that lambda 0 is equal to E. So these are paths that start, paths to G that start at, at E. But it's maybe, it seems a little bit weird to call it LG star, but of course I can identify this with omega 1 of S1G. Um, there's a natural identification there. Lambda 0 is E. I'm sorry, what did you say? Level 1? I, I, no, I do not want lambda 1 to be G. This is PEG is what it's sometimes called. These are paths that start at the identity and go wherever they want. And the, the reason is that basically, if you think about it, you can take such a path and you have its velocity, and that's going to be a map to G. Yeah. Maybe I'll ignore this. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you have to kind of fuss with it a little bit, but I'll actually work with this. Sorry, I, I, I added that. I shouldn't have added that. Um, it's not in my notes, but let's just go with this. But the point is you can take its derivative and you get, in any case, uh, an element, which means that I can have a pairing between LG. So I call it LG star um, for the reason that there is a pairing with LG, a linear palette pairing. It does not make it into the dual, but it, it acts a little bit like a dual, which you take lambda eta to you're just going to take the derivative of lambda prime eta. So this then is going to be a map to G, and this is a map to G, well, over 0, 1. So I can integrate those things. So this gives me a well-defined pairing between them, bilinear pairing. And I have an action of LG on LG star. Which is, I can say, if I take gamma dot lambda and I want to say what it is at time t, it's gamma of t, lambda of t, gamma of zero inverse. So hopefully I did that on the right side, but I, I didn't. Anyway. so. The thing to notice about this is that this action, so you can think of zero, you can think of, I'm gonna think of the constant path at E as being zero, I'm just gonna call it zero, and you can look at the stabilizer of zero. And it simply is not true that every element in LG fixes the constant path, right? That's just sort of obviously false. The only thing that fixes it is G. So this behaves, this, th this action is not a linear action, it's an affine action. That's basically, the, that's basically the point. And this confuses people almost always the first time they see this, is that when I'm in the finite dimensional case and I was looking at the action of G on G star or G, that was a linear action. And now I'm looking at an affine action. And really, the reason is is because there's a, a central extension hiding here. 
And really, I should be working with a central extension, but I'm not, so. If you want to look a little bit more like the other case, that's what you'd have to do. Wait, I'm sorry? Well, so, so what, when I say lambda, this is zero, this would be the identity. Oh, okay. So then I would be getting gamma of t, I'd be getting gamma of t, gamma of zero inverse, which is going to be always trivial if it was a constant, but not otherwise. So I'm saying zero, so, like I'm kind of treating this like a vector space, but I'm not writing it that way. The reason is you have two ways you want to look at it, and I'm sort of forcing it into one way. So it's, I mean, there's a lot of things here where there's a couple ways to look at them, and I, I feel like when I give a talk, if I give all the ways, it gets too confusing, so I, I just smush it a little bit, but yeah. Yes, 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 absolutely. LG is, is, is maps from S1, and I really think of S1 as the interval cro with, it, with the endpoints identified. Okay. So that was the little bit I needed about loop groups. And so then, I, once I have loop groups, I can talk about what do I mean by, um, I basically want to extend what I had before. I had Hamiltonian actions. I was looking at a compact group action on a, symplectic, on a finite dimensional symplectic manifold. And now I want to extend this to a loop group action on an infinite dimensional symplectic manifold. But otherwise, it's going to look almost exactly the same. So there's going to be a few places where it looks different. So here's the infinite dimensional case. So I want to start with X being a Bonnach manifold. And I'm going to assume that this has a weakly symplectic form. And this means that the map, so we've seen this before. But this is, I always get confused, the sharp and flat. But in any case, this induces a naturally a map from TM to T star of M. You just plug it in. And the assumption that this map is one to one. Of course, in the finite dimensional case, it's equivalent to being an isomorphism. Here it's not, but fine, this is what we need. And I'm going to let LG act on X omega again. So X on X preserves omega. And I'm going to assume that I have a proper moment map. Mu from X to LG star. And what do I mean by a proper moment map? Well, the same things I did before. This is equivariant with respect to the LG action. So I've defined an LG action on both places. And I want I xc x omega equals negative d mu xc for all xc in LG, which is still the algebra of my group. So I, I can formally define this. And then I'm going to do the same thing I did before, is for simplicity. I want zero to be a regular value. And now this is the confusing thing. I want to divide, the I want to define the symplectic quotient of X by LG. And well, I'm going to divide it, I'm going to take mu one versus zero, and then I'm going to divide by something. But I can only divide by things which fix, which take this set to itself, right? So they better fix zero. Otherwise, I can't possibly divide. 
And so I can divide by G, not LG. And so this looks weird, kind of, but that, that is the right thing to do. I mean, sort of a, you know, I don't know, we submitted this paper, well, there's two papers, and you know, the referee comes back and saying, oh, you made mistakes everywhere, you should have divided by LG. But no, it should be G, so we made that clearer. I think that's a good point. What's this? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly, which is what this, like I said, if you look, do the central extension, that's exactly what you're doing here. Nevertheless, it does confuse people, which maybe is an argument for doing the central extension, but that has its own thing. So anyway, um, yeah. So it's maybe not so surprising, but I'm just, it does confuse people regularly. Yes, that is the correct analogy. That's exactly right. And this is a complex symplectic orbifold, just as before. And just as before, if I want to compute the topology of the symplectic quotient, I just take the G equivariant cohomology of a level set. Okay, so this is the setup that I want to understand. So our goal now is I say, okay, in the case of the five dimensional case, we really have a very good understanding of the topology of the quotients. And we can learn things about interesting spaces this way. It turns out that many important spaces, including the moduli space I talked about at the beginning, arise in this way. And so we want to be able to understand this quotient just as well we did before. And the naive hope is, well, those theorems are still true. And basically, the main theorem is, yes, those theorems are still true. That's the simple version. Um, in order to make it useful, you want to be able to actually do calculations, and that's sort of to make it explicit, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay. So the key thing is a theorem that since many of the people are in the audience, I'm a little bit embarrassed about how it's going to sound. Hopefully you won't object to the way I'm writing this, because I'm writing it in a very strange way. So the theorem of Alexeyev, Malkin, and Mon Rankin is that there exists a nice compact manifold M and an equivariant map phi from M to G such that x, I can identify x with the, the set of pairs in M cross LG star, such that V of, oh, sorry, this is, such that V of M is the other endpoint. So my, my elements in LG star, remember, are paths that start at the identity and they end somewhere, right? And what you want is you want a pair where the path ends at phi of m. And mu of m lambda equals lambda. So this is a strange way of stating the theorem, because of course the real, I mean, they, they, this nice is a lot is hidden here. And really that's the point, is all the things you can say about it. They have this whole theory of g-valued moment maps and they analyze their properties extensively and they show that they're equivalent to these Bonnock manifolds. Um, but I, I haven't written all those details down because then, I mean, they come up, sort of pretty much every proof we do rests on the details of what this nice is, but I'm not gonna do those details in any way in this talk. So I'm not explaining them here. Um, but. And that's sort of the key. And in a lot of ways, the way I see it is this, this whole field is, is, a, is a question of like, is a dual nature. And there's this manifold, this infinite dimensional manifold X, and that really tells you what you expect to be true. And that sort of tells you how you expect the proofs to go. But when you actually do the proofs and you actually do the computations, they're all in terms of M and phi. And that's the practical side of it. And I will say, for example, an example of this is this M and phi, which they did prove, this M and phi, which I began the talk with. That's an example 
all the ones that arise this way. I mean, I'm not going to say it was an analog. I mean, it's the same paper. Yeah, and then we halfway did. Sorry? We, we, most of the, lots of the paper we did write it that way. I mean, the question is if you want to state your main theorem and you only want to have one main theorem, then in that statement you pick. It was really like the difference between talking about like natural numbers and like integers, which are positive, right? I mean, it's just <laughs> they're the same thing. That's what they proved. Um, but, I mean, I, that's going to be a little bit unfair. The statements tend to be a little bit cleaner with X in some ways, but you have, they exactly and immediately apply another, and are equivalent to another statement with group value moment maps. So it's really your choice, but the statements with X are much more closely analogous with the, with the finite dimensional case, and my mind tend to be cleaner. But the proofs are all through M. All the work is through M. So there's a little bit of a tension between the two approaches. Okay. So I've said I'm going to say that these theorems are true, but I need, um, I want to be able to state them. Um, so I'm going to define a set S, which is, remember, the same notation I had before in, um, I should do it this way. Sorry, I'm going to switch the order to be more consistent. So I'm going to look at the set of pairs in M cross G, such that C is in the stabilizer of M, and X of C equals 5M. And notice that I can think of M cross G, well, so first of all, I want to say that I can think of G as being inside LG star, and I can just send C to the map that sends T to E to the T C. Right? Given an element of the Lie algebra of G, I automatically get a path that starts with the identity, just exponentiating. And so, and if I do this, if I take this path, then at evaluated at 1, I get E to the C. So that's sort of the endpoint path for those elements. So this set, if I look at this inside of M cross LG star, this set naturally sits inside X, where I've identified X as pairs in M cross LG star. So I mean, that's sort of an aside. Here is a definition. And given a component of S and a point peak C in C, such that C is in T, so it's just more convenient to always work in the maximal torus. It doesn't really matter, but I mean, it helps with the statements. I can define two quantities, one which I call the external index, which is just the number of points conjugate um, sorry, conjugate to E in the interior of the geodesic gamma from 0, 1 to G, which sends T to E to the T C. So this is exactly the, um, the map we saw earlier. This identification is coming up again. And if you're familiar with uh, uh, bot's proof of bot periodicity, this is exactly what arises there. And this idea was basically taken wholesale from that paper. I mean, that's. 
And notice this only depends on C. It doesn't depend on the points in M at all. And that's why it's called sort of external index. And the other is the internal index. which is equal to, well, first of all, I have to say that if I look at, sorry, I'm going to move this over so I have a little bit more room. This is extremely analogous to what I did before. If I look at stabilizer of C, that's a subgroup of G, and I let it act on the Lie algebra T, where I look at T is inside LG star, then this is, uh, I could take mu inverse of this. This is not a manifold, but it is a manifold near P. And the claim is this is a symplectic stub of P representation, just like before we had this, right? Before we had a symplectic representation, which was defined nearly identically. And the internal index is twice the number of weights eta such that the pairing of eta and C is less than zero. So you see, this term is defined identically to the finite dimensional term. And this is, and this really comes from M. This, this can be defined totally, this can be calculated purely in terms of M. Um, I haven't stated it that way because I need to put a simple, I need to put a two form on M, which they do, but I didn't do today. But it's purely local calculation, and this is defined just in terms of C. So basically, we've broken this up into two pieces, and then we have the theorems, um, which are exactly analogous to Kirwan's theorem. The idea is, I mean, obviously, this is uh, things I worked on with Botts and Weitzman. And the first theorem is our old theorem that we published a while ago, which is just as before, we have the map from the G equivariant cohomology of X to the cohomology of the reduced space. And this is onto. Um, and the other theorem, and there's been other approaches to the same problem, but the new theorem, so this is just the old theorem, the real point of today's talk is the new theorem is that we can compute the Poincaré polynomial of the reduced space. And it looks exactly like what we had before. This is the equivariant Poincaré polynomial of X minus the sum over all components of the critical set except for mu inverse of zero. And remember, that's because I've already had mu inverse of zero here. I didn't throw it away. Let's put it on that side of T, so the external index of C plus the internal index of C times the equivariant Poincaré polynomial of C. So this is the formula. And you can see it's exactly, it's very, very analogous to um, the other case sort of what you'd expect. Um, so let me say a little bit about why it's true. The proof, I only have, what, two minutes? OK, I'll be very quick. Um, the proof, so, so morally, is that if I look at mu squared, this is a Morse function in the sense of Kerouin, of course, with 
critical set C and index lambda i plus lambda e. So this is exactly what we did before. This is the same proof. However, the one thing you'll notice is I put the word morally here. And the problem is, is that x is an infinite dimensional manifold. Some people like infinite dimensions. I don't. Um, so maybe you could do it by really understanding that, the analysis of more straight infinite dimensional manifolds. But you don't need to. And so the idea is, so remember that x is subset of m cross lg star. So you can replace lg star, which is just any path, with piecewise geodesic paths with n breaks, with n corners. Right? Instead of allowing any function, you sort of only allow ones which are piecewise geodesic. And so this is finite dimensional, but it approaches x as n approaches infinity. It has to be made more formal, obviously, but that's the idea, is that it's a finite dimensional approximation. You have a series of finite dimensional approximations, which give you excellent approximations of your space. Um, and so um, I'm out of time. I will just say that this is sort of half the work in our paper, and the other half is actually sort of computing these internal indexes explicitly in coordinates, you know, using very much sort of the AMM um, thing. And we are able to get explicit answers which agree with the classical answers in the case that we started with. So I could write it on the board, but it's just the answer you know and love if you've seen that. Um, so I think I better stop here. That is correct. That is correct. That's right. That's right. And in fact, so if you, if you look at, say, the SU2 case, that is very easy. And you sort of, this sum, the, it turns out, in the SU2 case, then the internal index doesn't depend on your C at all. That just sort of doesn't matter at all. And you just end up multiplying everything by 1 over 1 minus t squared, and you just get the fixed point. So it, it really simplifies drastically. Um, there's a little bit more complicated for other groups, but it's always true that things just end up repeating. It's really only a finite number of calculations. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yep. In the case of mapping, are the other components for comparing polynomials or no? So, yes. Um, yes. Um, so, so far, at least, we haven't done any new calculations. Um, I'm not sure whether we will be able to. And partially it's because I've been working on proving and writing out the calculations we've done rather than working on trying to. But one thing we could maybe do, um, but we haven't done, to be clear, is just idea bot do things over the integers in some cases. And I believe that we could too. But, but we haven't done it. <laughs> I mean, I, I hope we could too, I guess. I mean, there's no real, there's no reason why, I mean, whatever, you know. Something you haven't done is never done, but it seems like it ought to be a doable problem. So that's what I'm trying to say. So far, we have not done that yet, and I don't know. I think, I think, I think that's, the answer is I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other, whether we can do. That, of course, is the hope, is to, is to get new things that haven't been known. I mean, certainly, this is a much more general framework, right, because it works for any uh, LG space. But I would like to get new classical results. Um, but we don't have a concrete plan for that, I would say, is the most but we plan to look into it. <laughs>